All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to week nine. Uh, you just had a week off. Hopefully you tried to rest a little. Uh, some of us rested more than others. And that's fine. Um, thank you. Now, the um, you may have noticed the way the course is laid out that basically put after the break, it's like a clean full stop and we started with a fresh set of topics so the first half was to give you the base knowledge to understand the second half but the good news is that nothing from the first half will be tested on again so it's we designed this course originally so that it was designed like two small courses back to back one lays the theoretical foundation one is the practical foundations so that's the good news for you guys. Um, when you get do your final exam, it's starting today. Not, whatever, January, which is good for everybody. Um, so it's a clean break. It's all good. Um, there's been a rotation of lab profs. Um, some of you may have already noticed that uh, one of Doug's groups has now got a new prof. I literally was introduced to him a few days ago. So. Uh, I can't remember his name. I can't. I can't remember anybody's names. So yeah, I know a part of one of his the names starts with a W. Wander. There we go. Thanks. So that's the best I could remember of his name. Is start with a W. I feel really shitty. Um. So for the rest of this term, during the the demos, there'll be a lot of demos during lecture. As in, I'll be typing stuff in on my laptop, so you get to see how badly I type. Um, IDEs are amazing to make you not type a lot nowadays, so once you know how to use the IDEs properly. And um, you will need to, if you want to follow along with what I'm doing, you'll need to import uh, one of the databases. I sent out the announcement already today. Uh, at least I hope I sent it to the right group. A little blurry. Yeah, so I'm not actually going to use that one today. It's starting next week, but I figured I'd mention it now so that you have all week to try to get yourself sorted out with it. I gave you guys very short how to bring it bring it into MySQL instructions, but essentially the instructions for lab for lab seven, the first part is almost identical for this, which I think I did mention in the announcement. Um, so that's that. All right, so basically put, we're going to be focusing on SQL for the rest of the term. And we're going to basically talk about various topics about SQL, including uh, how to create table structures. So you know how you were drawing your little diagrams last term? Well, this time you're going to learn how to do it by typing all the commands in. Um, we're going to talk about how uh, referential integrity is implemented. In other words, you know when you draw in the relationship, on the diagram, how you make it happen in the database. Um, you'll learn some of the uses for different views um, and amongst other things. This is basically the topics for the rest of the term, almost this slide. All right, so SQL. SQL stands for Structured Query Language. It was developed by IBM in the 1970s. And this is where I always go off on a tangent about SQL. You'll notice I'm saying SQL, I'm not saying SQL, because that pisses me off. It's like somebody says, hey, the company that made SQL is called IBM. No, actual fact, the reason why SQL stuck originally is that IBM was planning to call it SQL and then they were taken to court and they lost a, lost a court case. It was a company in Great Britain that owned the copyright to the product called SQL. So IBM said, okay, we'll just drop most of the vowels. We'll call it SQL. It's an initialism, not an acronym. So there, there's my rant about SQL. Um, there's standards to SQ, for SQL, and they're usually listed like SQL 2008, SQL 2011, you know, 216. Strangely enough, the most implemented SQL standard is SQL 99, um, as in 1999. And that's literally 
98% of the features in SQL you're going to use is from the 1999 standard. The new versions just keep adding, as typical, new features, right? So they release new versions. New versions give you new features, including uh, JSON support, XML support, object-oriented concepts. Um, one of the really popular database public, sorry, open source database engines out there called Postgres uh, supports object inheritance. So you know how you guys are learning about objects in Java, maybe? And um, you'll learn about inheritance next term, probably polymorphism. Postgres is actually able to, you know, cause table inheritance. Define a table, then you can inherit it into another table. It's kind of cool. Um, so the course textbook often refers to stacks of SQL Server 2019. We're going to use MySQL Server for our demonstrations for this course. Um, for good and bad, it is what it is. MySQL is like a foot fungus. It's everywhere and you just can't get rid of it. Um, there are better options. However, second you do any kind of web development, it always, almost always starts with MySQL. So, you know. All right. So SQL is a sub-language. It's not a full featured programming language. It's at this point in time, um, we can refer to it as a general purpose language versus a single purpose language. Java, C, PHP, Python, Perl, Rust, take your pick of languages. Those are general purpose languages. You basically can write almost any kind of program with it. SQL, R, uh, Mathematica. Those are single purpose languages. They're designed to do one kind of thing and do it really, really well. Thus, it's not a fully featured programming language. It is ubiquitous. Essentially, if somebody starts talking about a database, it's going to have an SQL implementation. Unless you're talking about a no SQL database, which we will not cover in this course, because um, this course is all about relational database systems, not non-relational. Um, what's kind of funny, going the way long way around now, what's kind of funny is that a lot of NoSQL database engines have started bolting on SQL-like syntax on top of it because SQL just does such a good job at doing what it does. It really has not changed very much since it was first created in the 1970s. Like I learned it when I went to school, so I learned it in 1995, and very little has changed except for joints and a few you no know, features and things like that. But for the most part, what I learned is exactly what you guys are going to learn. The guys at IBM did a good job. They basically designed something usable, functional, straight out of the box, and then since then it's just been refining it. Um, it's ubiquitous because any kind of enterprise database system will have it built in. So Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, IBM DB2, um, Sybase, whatever the heck it's called now, it's been bought like five times. Uh, Postgres, MySQL, MySQL is definitely not enterprise. Um, but, you know, uh, anything running on Amazon Cloud, the, uh, remote, uh, the relational database services, or Azure, uh, the Azure Data Cloud, um, basically put, they all give you SQL. So in, as a programmer, learning SQL is a critical skill in the sense that it will give you a foundation that even if you don't work with databases, you'll probably have to talk with someone that works with databases. And knowing what they're talking about will make your life a lot easier. All right, so the SQL language is broken down into separate subsets. There's the data definition language, DDL. This is what's used to actually create the structure. Um, you can think of this as basically the construction crew that builds your house. There are the, the contractors that come in, they put up the walls, they knock out the windows, you know, whatever. They build the structure. A DML. A DML is the language used for manipulating the data itself. So adding records, deleting records, changing records, retrieving records. 
basically it's the same language as when you decorate your house. You put stuff into the room, you look around, you rearrange it, take it out, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, SQL persistent stored modules, we will not talk about those because they exist in Microsoft SQL Server and Oracle. Um, yeah, that's like a level two topic. Transaction control language, TCL. Uh, TCL is actually a subset of the D, uh, DML. Uh, we will be touching on that for one lecture right at the end. Uh, transaction control language is really, really important. You would not want any kind of financial organization not using these. Uh, and then there's data control language. Um, data control language has to do with access rights and permissions and administration, which again, this course is not about administration, so we won't touch on that. And for those of you that are curious and you have actually found my YouTube channel, you can always follow the DCL lectures that I'll be giving my students tomorrow in my other course. So if you're interested in the DCL stuff, I'm teaching it on my SQL basically tomorrow for the other group. So we are gonna focus on the first two and a little bit of TCL. So the first important one is the create table statement. And create table is literally designed to create tables. Uh, they say create relations on the slide, but you're creating tables. And each column is described with three parts. You give it a name, a data type, and some optional constraints. And the basic formats as listed on the slide here, um, once I have a few more slides under my belt, I'll switch over to MySQL and actually show you guys. So column and table constraints. These are some of the things you might've experienced when you were playing with the workbench design tool, the ERD tool, where you can designate things as primary keys or foreign keys, uh, whether something is null or not null, uh, whether it's unique and whether there's a check rule. Now check rule is something you guys did not learn. Um, we're gonna worry about that later. And then there is a default keyword, which is not technically a constraint, but you can use it to set initial values. Um, and these are the constraints you use when you create a table, but you can also use them during the alter table command, which I'll be showing you guys in a bit. So this is a sample of a create table command for MySQL. So when you look at it, you'll see that there's a table name. You can see each row has a column name, a data type, and then some constraints and or modifiers. What's interesting on this one is that this one's specific for MySQL. I actually updated all these slides so they're using the right commands for you guys. This used to use SQL server commands. Uh, not very useful considering you can't actually type these in. Uh, MySQL uses this thing called auto increment for synthetic keys. It's basically a clicker, one, two, three, four. Every time you add a row, it just gives you the next number. Um, Last name and first name set to car 25, not null. Uh, nationality, car 30, null. Here's a pro tip. The word null is optional. Not null, if you want something to be not null, you put it in, but if you want to allow it to be null, then you just put in null. Um, and then you got a couple of constraints at the bottom. Uh, the first one defines the primary key and there should actually be a space right there. Um, and the other one actually defines a unique key saying that the first name and last name must be unique. So these are a few sample rules of when you're creating a table. Um, so I am actually going, and this is just a longer example, but I'm actually gonna do a couple of examples on screen instead of going through these. So you can actually see it work better. So the slides are good because they got a complete example for you of all the bits and pieces, but I'll show you guys the important ones. All right. You go to MySQL, some of you may not have done this yet. When you click on local instance, it'll bring up something that looks like this. Um, you'll notice on the left, you have a list of schemas. I have a lot more than you guys do. And what isn't shown in slides yet is actually how to create the database. like that. And let me make that a little bit bigger. When I hit the run buttons, this one here, there's a keyboard shortcut. Um, and it'll say created. You'll notice on the left, it does not show up yet. So I'm gonna refresh. 
and then you'll see there's lecture six. So the next thing you want to do is you want to use it. And you'll notice that it automatically jumped down and made it bold and you know, opened it up. Use means you want to connect to that database. Now use is MySQL specific. Create database is not. Create database exists everywhere. Use is MySQL specific. Other database engines have a slightly different syntax. Uh, Postgres uses backslash C for connect. So different engines use different syntax, so don't get too hung up about the syntax. It's just what it is. All right, so I, now I'm in lecture six. So I'm gonna create a table. Now, the SQL language is not case sensitive for its commands. Depending on your database engine, object names and attributes, also known as columns, may or may not be case sensitive. MySQL is very not case sensitive. Microsoft SQL Server depends what code page you install it on. For those of you that don't know what the code page is, it's what language the server's running. Latin one, it's not case sensitive, uh, but there is actually one that is actually case sensitive, some ISO 8895 or something that is case sensitive. Depending what mode you install your server, it will be case sensitive or not. Oracle lies. Uh, because it stores both object names as however you typed it in and in uppercase, thus it's case insensitive. It just doesn't tell you it did that. And uh, PostgreSQL, which is, you know, um, a really popular database, is super case sensitive, like insanely case sensitive. It cares ever so much about how you type things in. So create table. This could be uppercase, could be lowercase. Uh, I'm going to call my table sample. I'm going to open up my parentheses. So as a good habit, you should always close your parentheses when you open them. I mean, by now you probably have already burned, gotten burned a few times in your Java class because you forgot to close a parentheses or you forgot to close a curly. Just as a, as a good habit, when you open, close it. And most SQL editors are not kind enough to do what a lot of the IDEs where, you know, if you use like JetBrains IntelliJ, where it you know automatically does your curlies for you and your parentheses and all that fun stuff. So the first thing I'm going to put in here, I'm going to create a uh, in a my first column. I'm going to call it ID. It's going to be an integer. And the funny thing is about the primary key is if you have a single column primary key, you do not need to define it as a constraint. You can actually say right here. So if it's a single column primary key, you can put, pull it, put it right there. And I want this to be auto, no. Auto increment. Now I'm gonna put in a name, which is gonna be a varcar 75, not null. And uh, created. Uh, date, time, default, that's right, it doesn't support that syntax, it's default now. Um, you know, um, I'm going to leave this one as is. Let's see how many error messages I get. Let's of course, now I changed it to this, and I'm going to run it, and am I going to get an error? No. Yay. I actually typed it in right. Uh, you're going to see a lot of errors while I'm doing these demos. Um, primary key is automatically not null. So if you use the keyword primary key on a single column primary key, congrats. It saves you a bit of typing. However, if you have a compound primary key, things get a little more tricky. So now I'm going to create another table called sample2. And this one here, I am going to do um, a compound key. So I'm going to leave primary key out of here. But I'm going to leave the ID here. 
And then I'm going to add a sample ID, which is an INT, which is not null. And I can go constraint primary key. And I'm probably going to get this one wrong because half the time, yeah, okay. So let me explain what's happening on here, and I'll use these guys on this side today. So I've created two columns, I've created a table here, and I've got a sample ID as a not null. I've got an ID up here which is auto increment. Um, name stayed the same, created stayed the same. I create a constraint, and the syntax is when you do a constraint down here, you say, I'm creating constraint, in other words, constraint says you're setting a rule. You always have to give it a name which in this case I'm calling, since this is sample table two, sample two PK, whatever. It's a primary key. And then in the parentheses, you list off the columns that participate in the primary key. And I am going to run this and hope it works. Actually, no, I'm not going to run this. I'm going to add one more constraint. There we go. That's the other one I wanted. So I'm listing off a second constraint. These are actually in the slides. So, you know, you actually have examples that match this. So this is a foreign key constraint. So I go constraint sample to FK. You can call this whatever you want. Like it really does not care. The only rule is, is that the constraint has to have a unique name within the table itself. So if I want to use sample to PK in another table, I can. I just can't use sample 2PK in the same table twice. So then I define it as a foreign key. Now the foreign key syntax you'll notice is a little more uh, verbose than the primary key syntax. So the way that works is that's the foreign key, sample ID here, and it's gonna reference the sample table, which I just created, and it's gonna reference the ID column in the sample table. And now I'm going to run it and let's go see if I made a liar to myself. And I broke it. It's not sampled, it's sample. All right. Perfect time to talk about error messages. I usually wait till I make my first mistake before I talk about error messages. Oh, well, that's spelling, who cares? It's not a syntax issue at this point. So you will notice that you're going to get error messages, at least in MySQL, at the bottom. And this is where you guys got to learn how to read error messages. Because this is not like in, it's this not like Eclipse, which tells you exactly where you made your mistake. You know, when you make a mistake in Eclipse, it's usually pretty clear. You know, it'll throw all kinds of red stuff on the screen and the compiler will give you errors. And often it's pretty accurate as to what the mistake is. With SQL, is it will continue running until it hits something it doesn't understand. The problem is that you might have started something three lines above that's causing the error further down. So usually when you see an error message like this, um, right here, error code 1824, failed to open the reference table, table sampled. This, I wish I could make that bottom chunk bigger, but I can't. So that bottom one, it's saying that it can't find the table you were trying to refer to when you're creating the foreign key because it's called sampled, but I called it sample. So the error message is, hey, you're trying to find something that doesn't exist. Other times you have other weird error messages and you literally have to start going backwards from wherever it talks about. You'll see, you know, there's an error on line five or error uh, at character 48. And you literally start going backwards from there until you find what actually caused the error. Let's try this again. And it worked. Usually it takes me about four tries. 
it's going well today. I spent a lot of time typing SQL actually this morning, so that's probably why my brain's in the right spot. I actually, what I'm going to do Come on. Why are you taking so long to launch? Paste. I'm just going to run this right back to the way it was. So that you guys, I can give you guys basically the log from today. That'll make your guys' life easier. Uh, at least there'll be the log as per where things were. All right. So I've created two tables. So far, you've seen me create tables with primary key, compound primary key, a foreign key, a few constraints and a default. Um, nothing, nothing fancy, nothing complicated, but that's literally when your example, using MySQL Workbench, you go create a table, you add three columns, and then you just give it a name, you give it the data type, and you hit the right checkboxes for the columns properties. That's literally what it generates is this with actually a lot more noise. Um, not sure if your lab profs are gonna catch you on this, but those of you that try to get clever and get around the fact you gotta type this in, we can tell when it's machine generated. It doesn't look like this when the machine generates it. When the machine generates it, it often looks like, no. No. Uh, no, not this CST8215. It looks like this. It's got all kinds of things in here that are not things we're teaching you guys. So we can tell if you try to take shortcuts. Just just putting it out there, we can tell. Yeah, oh, great. You, then you know SQL, MySQL better than any of the profs teaching this course. And you should be here with me. <laughs> so I've been working with MySQL for 15 years and three quarters of those commands, I don't know them. I just copy them from another file. I don't have time to memorize every single piece of syntax. It's just too much. Okay, so back to the slide deck. Um, so if you want to make um, foreign, the foreign key constraints, there's a few things if you want to make them uh, optional or not. So when I created the sample two table, which is going to be, of course, I've lost undo. Let's go this one. You'll notice that I made sample ID right here, not null. That means it's mandatory. So you know when you're drawing um, your relationships in the diagram and you do not null, means this. Null means this. Or, you know, uh, like that or like that. So when you're talking about making rules mandatory or not, null and not null is what actually, not null. This line is not null. This circle is null. Not null. Sorry. Null, not null. There you go. That's what the slide's talking about. I'd rather just draw the picture than talk about the slide. And then we got an insanely complicated sample uh, that shows a bit of, abs of all kinds of things. Now, what's kind of funny is, um, depending what version of MySQL you're running, these will not work. The check constraints are for you to determine physical rules. And it used to be a very common way to enforce the rules back in the day where the server running the applications were very limited in resources. So you'd get the database server to do some of the work, get two computers to do the work instead of one. 
Um, honestly, as a person that does this for a living, I can count on my hands with my fist closed how many times I've used check constraints. How many fingers am I holding up? 26 years. Okay. Now, there are people that are big fans of check constraints. The problem is that every time you do, you create a check constraint and then you decide, oh, we now need to add a new nationality. Um, let's pull out Yugoslavia as an example where Yugoslavia no longer exists. It's now, what, three, four countries? Right? So depending on... Yeah, things like where you suddenly need to constantly change the rules, it's stupid to do it right in the database. But yes, the check constraints allow you to actually hard code rules right in the database to make sure that the data being passed in from the program follows certain rules. I have, actually, that's not quite true. I have used a few check constraints over the years to make sure that, you know, things like quantity is always greater than zero. Because it's, been known to happen where a programmer just gets lazy and they don't check quantity before they save and you know i'd rather have it blow up than bad data go in but for fancy things like uh date of birth before date deceased great it works you can do that if you try to insert a value into this table and the date of deceased is actually before the date of birth it will raise some sort of weird error and then the problem is that the error is not user friendly. The programmer then has to read this error, interpret it, write code to handle it, which you should have written about five lines above to make sure it couldn't happen in the first place. Uh, this is all stuff that QA catches, if you have QA. Um, same thing with valid birth year. It's actually checking to see if it's at least, uh, you know, you know Year 1000 to 2999, like that's a useful, you know, year check for a date of birth, date of birth. Uh, that kind of thing. So these are just some of the fancier ones that you can see. Um, most of these are not practical. That's just showing you what you can do. Oh, and by the way, the last two don't work in MySQL. You can define them and MySQL just ignores it. Uh, MySQL is a lot like my kids when they were young. You tell them not to do something and then they just ignored you and they still did it. For those of you that have young kids in here, I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. Pick up your shoes. No. The couch is not your dumping ground. Mound. All right. So that was create. So the next one is alter table. Now, alter table can be used to add, remove, and change columns. Um, you can add, use it to add and remove constraints. The funny thing is about alter table is that the syntax varies depending on what database backend you're working with. Renaming a column in MySQL is not the same as renaming a column in my Microsoft SQL Server. Even so, the way the SQL standard is written is something along the lines of alter table command allows you to rename a column. Database. Company A implements it like this. Database company B implements it like that. And after a while, you know, they all go, well, we should have made it all the same. And then they just continue ignoring the problem. Um, so I'm going to show you guys a few examples. If you're trying to know how to do something specific, Google is your friend. Literally, MySQL space, rename space, column. And you'll find most of this stuff. So I am going to... The first one shows you how to add a column. And it's pretty straightforward. You alter the table, give the table name. You say add. And by the way, there's actually an optional keyword here, which I actually I like using, which is column. So you go alter table customer, add column. Give it a name, data type, any constraints it has. It's literally after the word add. Right here. This is exactly the same as it would be for a column definition in your create table. Drop column, well, you don't need to get too fancy with that one because you just drop the column. You'll notice it's not delete. With DDL, it is create, alter, drop. So 
create to add something, alter to change it, drop to get rid of it. And the keyword drop will be in multiple places. So I am going to go alter my sample table. And I am going to run it, and it just runs. You will notice that it runs really, really fast. And even on big databases, this runs really, really fast. And this is where I give you your second warning about SQL. There's no one do. You screw up. And I've done this, oh, so many times. Um, you screw up, you're now fixing your problem. You're not undoing your problem. Uh, this could apply to both insert, update, and delete when you're playing with the records versus changing the structure of a table. Um, so if I refresh my tables over here, uh, hit the refresh. Hello. You'll notice on the left, I got my two tables. And here's sample, and you can see its columns right here. So I add a column called date of birth. Yay. And I can turn around and go drop column. At least it'll warn you that there's a, a literally a syntax error it knows about. You'll notice it's underlining the word date. Um, that's because there's not supposed to be anything at this point. So I'm going to go go. And I'm going to just go kill the lights, the board lights. So I'm noticing that it's really washing out. There we go. So I'm going to run this. And OK, I ran this twice. You'll notice the first one ran. The second one gave me an error message. And it says, can't drop date of birth. Check the column or key exists. I think that error message is pretty straightforward. Um, if I refresh my view, you'll notice that the column is now gone. It is quick. It is instant. It's like driving down the Queensway with your doors off and no brakes. It just goes. Um, so that's how you alter a table. Um, now, there's ways of renaming a column. You can also change the data type. So I'm going to add the column date of birth back in. Uh, this time I'm going to make it a uh, date time. Great. It happened. So what I can do now, and let's see if I can remember the syntax off the top of my head, because I usually work with Postgres, not with MySQL, and the syntax is different. So I'm going to take a guess that I remember this from last term. Alter column, and I'm going to make this uh date no that's not it of course now i gotta go look it up darn i was really hoping i was going to remember it is it in the slides no that's not that's the constraints great remember when i said i'm gonna you guys got to get friendly with google why not it's wrong with sending it. microsoft's already got all my information why it to google too MySQL uh, change data type. I can never remember the stupid syntax. Modify. There. Go. See, Postgres uses alter alter column. Um. And uh, you can also rename a column since I discussed that one, rename column. And um, you can also use, look at that one, change. And so you can see right here, here it is an Oracle. 
And this is the MySQL version of it. So, you know, just punch in a few words and away it goes. This is the first time I've had Bing actually give me uh, their AI results. So that's that first box at the top. It's summarizing a Stack Overflow article into a nice little box for me. That was kind of cool. That was an aside. All right, so. This is the syntax add constraint, the syntax to remove constraint. You'll notice you can add constraint, you give it a name. Then after that, it's whatever the kind of constraint is going to be, a check constraint, a foreign key, primary key. I've seen some software that when you design the database, it creates the table and then it creates the constraints separately. So it creates the table first and then it'll create the primary key. Then it'll create the foreign keys. Then it'll et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and to drop the constraint, you alter the table, you drop the constraint, you have to know what it's called. And how do you know what it's called? When you look at the tables over here, you'll see it has its columns, it has its foreign keys. If it has indexes, there'll be some indexes in here too. And um, you can also go alter table here, which will give you, and that went almost nowhere. It will also show you any of the foreign keys that it has, um, any of the columns that have constraints, it'll show you them here too. So, you know, there's a few different ways for you to see what's happening. All right, it's really easy to remove a table. So, so far I've shown you guys how to create a table. I added a column to cut a column. It is, yeah, this is just drop table. Give it a name and it's gone instantly. Oh yeah, there's no undo, it's gone. Um, and the way it works is different database engines will do this slightly differently from each other. Um, MySQL, what it does, it basically marks the table as no longer existing in the metadata of the database. So in the in MySQL, there's something called meta metadata and the metadata defines this table is this file on disk. What it goes and does is you go drop table, it just takes it out of the metadata and then it schedules a job later for cleanup. And it just calls on the crew to clean up the bodies when it's done. It's very, very quick. Um, other database engines are significantly more destructive. Postgres does literally deletes it from metadata and nukes the table off the disk at the same time. Oh yeah. So if, for example, if I wanna get rid of my second table here, I'm gonna go drop table sample two, like this, I hit run and it's gone. Okay. Right. It's one table at a time. You can't drop, you do them one table at a time. One table per line? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can have a bunch of commands. And there's a few other piece syntax here. Here's the renaming column um, that I just Googled. Whatever. I can never remember where they had it in the slides. Uh, so you have a sample of how to rename a column. And a drop table, I just showed you guys how that works. So I don't need to go through this slide in detail, but you can do multiple things. You will notice at this point that yes, there are multiple commands on the same example. And as he just said, can you do more than one table at once? Not with a single command, but you can have multiple commands in your interpreter. And it will have your very most favorite character as a C-like developer. Semicolon. You semicolon to limit your commands. This is where MySQL is extra special. It, you can have it all as one single line of code, just like you can in Java, and it'll work. Um, SQL cares about white space between keywords and commands. It doesn't care about carriage returns. As long as you don't break up 
or a command into multiple pieces, it's fine. So this, you know, could have been written like this and that would work. And I could put my semicolon on the last line. It would work. It doesn't care. I could have, that will also work. It doesn't care that way. It just cares that there's separation between magic keywords and object names and that kind of stuff. Okay, so the next one is the truncate command. Now, <clears throat> truncate is weird. It's a command that straddles both DDL and DML, depending on what database engine you're using. In Postgres and Oracle, it's wholly into DML land, which is insert, update, and delete. With my MySQL, it's in both because not only does it nuke the contents of the table, it also resets the auto increment to one. So if you truncate the table, it resets the auto increment to the smallest value. So it's as if you reset the table completely. Um, truncate is used to purge the contents of a table while leaving the structure intact. So instead of dropping the table and then recreating the table, you can just truncate the table. And truncate is also very, very, very fast. Um, how does it work? It literally goes, table, there's nothing in here anymore. Thanks. That's my TED talk. Literally, that's the end of the moment. It could just, that's it. It tells the table that there's no content there, and the table says, okay. And it sets a cleanup job, you know, a little bit later, something runs in the background and cleans it up off the disk. Um, it's a bit like on Windows, well, kind of Mac too. When you delete a file on Windows, you know it doesn't really delete the file, right? It marks it marks the space as available. Literally, it like in the older DOS, like in the older DOS and you know, Windows ninety five days and Windows ninety eight, you could literally, if you, as long as you didn't rewrite to the disk, you could recover anything that was deleted off the disk. And this works similarly, except that you can't recover it. It just marks the space as available. And if the table happens to be occupying 20 megabytes on the disk, congratulations, you've pre-allocated 20 megabytes. And it'll just keep overwriting the contents of that space over and over and over again with each truncate. Um, some people wonder, well, why do you want to use a truncate? Uh, often truncate is used on log tables. Uh, it's used on uh, when you're doing imports. So you're importing data into a database system of some sort. You will take the data, you load it into a temporary table while you munge the data. And then when you're done, you munge. Let's modify the data. Truncates the table, and then it's ready to go for the next import. You do not ever run truncate on transactional data. You do not truncate your customer's table. You do not truncate orders like i've never done that by accident that's what backups are for okay um no because you lose everything that happened after the backup so let's say your backup was at 2 a.m and you screwed up at 9 a.m you lose everything between 9 a.m and 2 a.m so it's not an undo it's a uh, let's pretend it never happened. No. Truncates the entire table. Uh, there is ways to empty out the contents of a single column, and I'll be talking about that when I talk about update in a bit. Um, and I jumped around. So we're actually going to talk about indexes later in the term, so I'm skipping this slide. I really don't know why this is here because we're talking from truncate to insert. And then they threw indexes in the middle. Uh, we actually do talk about indexes at the end of the term. So, all right. So insert is the next statement. So, so far we covered DDL. And it's actually, unlike Java where it's a little weird, especially if you've never programmed before, 
things like a for loop might not come intuitively to you if you've never written a line of code in your life. SQL is fairly English. Yes, I'm well aware that 95% of this class, English is not your first language. I've never had such a high number, but it's a very English-like language. In other words, you give it commands that are written with plain English words, and it, as long as you follow its syntax rules, it's fairly understandable. So create table, alter table, drop table. I've shown you examples. So that's DDL. DML is insert, update, delete, and select. Now, some of you might be going, well, why did they choose those words? And I wish I had brought my file folder. I usually bring a file folder just to show you guys. The guys who wrote this language originally said, well, we're adding a new record to the database. So it's like adding a new piece of paper in a file folder. So we're going to insert the paper into the folder. That's literally where insert comes from. The rest of them, on the other hand, well, select makes sense too, because you're going to pick, you're going to select the one you want or the records you want. Update, well, you know, that's pretty straightforward because you're changing it. And then delete is the only one that really doesn't have a real world analogy because you don't delete things in the real world. You trash them, burn them, shred them. Could have been any of those other words. Yeah, burn it with fire. So the insert statement works as follows. You go insert into whatever table. You list off the columns you're going to populate. So if you have a table that allows nulls, you do not need to include those columns. You only, if you're supposed to fill it, yes, include those columns. But at a minimum, you must include the not nulls. Columns that have a default value do not need to be listed necessarily unless you want to use something other than the default value. So you list off the columns, then you give it the list of values, common delimited. And you will notice that in here, some of the examples have quotes around it, some do not. Strings are quoted. That might come as a shock. But strings are quoted because it cares about spaces. Therefore, if you have words of spaces, how is it going to know that's all part of the same string? Dates are quoted. And that one comes as a shock to people too, because a lot of people will write their dates. I'm going to go insert a date, and then they write it like this. Okay. It's a date, right? No, it's not. It's math. 2022 minus 12 minus 15. Now it's a date. Because the SQL interpreter can do math. It's the world's stupidest calculator. No, no, I kid you not. So you insert. So anything that's a string or a date gets quoted. Numbers are not quoted, including numbers with decimal places. Um, you'll see often in data generation algorithms that they'll quote the numbers. And some database engines will allow it. MySQL, for example, will allow it. Other database engines will not allow it. it. So your mileage may vary. So as a rule of thumb, I say follow the ANSI standard, which is quote strings. Don't quote numbers. Um, I know you guys have not learned about casting yet in your Java course. Um, I'm, usually by now you have not learned about casting. Casting is when you take one data type, you make it become something else. So you take a string, cast it to an integer, or take an integer, cast it to a string. In database, when you do something like a number in quote marks, it's called coercing. Coercing. You're forcing it to be something it doesn't want to be. As opposed to casting, which you can cast, but you explicitly tell it to cast. When you coerce, the database interpreter has to look at the data and go, can I actually work with this? And it has to go through it character by character to make sure everything is valid. You're gonna when you coerce a data type, you're adding ten dozens of operations on every insert. If you're casting, it doesn't need to do dozens of operations. It needs to do with the cast. If you do not quote your integers, 
congratulations, it doesn't even need to think about it because you're giving it what it expects. So, yeah, so that's my talk about, you know, your strings versus your numbers. Uh, there's something called a bulk insert, which allows you to do a select statement, which this is kind of dumb. I'll wait till next week to actually cover this one be because you guys haven't learned about select. Therefore, why would I talk about, right? So I'm going to give you guys a demo of the insert statement. Insert into sample. Name. Values. Bob, oops. Oh, first of all, let's make sure that I actually created my table correctly. If I run this, one row created. I am going to click on this and go um, to select rows. And you'll see here's my happily created. Now, for example, see your date of birth is null. I added the date of birth column, but it's null because I allowed it to be null. So it's not required. Now, if I go um, created and date of birth, date of birth, I did call that date of birth, right? And in here, I'm going to go put this on a second row just so it's easier to read. Time to go. 2023-01-01. And uh, was Cree as uh, born uh, 1975, 03, 07, 40 years ago today. and go. Now, if I come back over here and I just rerun this, you will see the second one has been populated with those extra columns of the values I fed it. The other thing you will notice is the created does not have a time on it. This is where, and this is all database engines do this. So this isn't just my SQL being special. All database engines do this. If you're populating a date time field and you only feed it the date, it assumes midnight. Zero, 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 zero. Dot four zeros after that, technically. So there's your, your data types. You'll also notice how the, t the date is formatted. It's not formatted the stupid American way. month, day, year. It's not formatted some of the weird ways they do in some of the European countries, which is day, month, year. It goes in order of si decrementing, uh, de decrementing size, biggest to smallest, year, month, day, hour, minutes, seconds, milliseconds. This is universal in all database engines. This is also known as C standard time. Get used to this time format. Um, why not the opposite? Because different database engines will be able to interpret it or not. For example, if I feed it 0101 2023, is it January 1st? In this case, it'll be January 1st, no matter what. Okay, if I go 0102 2023, is it January 1st or February 1st? So therefore, if you follow this format, it's always going to be right. Magic. Okay, the update statement. You'll notice the syntax is completely different from the insert statement. This is one of those one spots where MySQL actually did something kind of clever. They created an insert statement that follows the same syntax as the update, but nobody else follows it. So. Just don't bother learn the special insert statement for MySQL because nobody else uses it. The All the developers for SQL, I swear, were all sitting in different rooms and not talking to each other. They decide to all have slightly different syntax for every command. This is the hardest part of learning SQL, is that every command has a different structure. Once you wrap your brain around that, 
it's all good. All right, so the syntax is update, table, set, key pair values, column name equals value. And you can give it a list, comma, column two, value two, comma, column three, value three. You'll notice that there's something called a where statement on there at the end. You're, that's, you're targeting a specific row in the database with the where. You guys will be getting very familiar with where starting next week. Yes, which is going to lead me to the question she asked earlier about truncating a single column. When you don't include your where statement, it applies to the entire table. Let me demonstrate. All right, so if I come back over here and I go update sample set name equal to uh, Jane, where ID is equal to two. So let's, first things first, right now it's Rob. Rob decided to no longer identify as Rob. And now he's Jane. But somewhere along the way, somebody said we should be all inclusive and decided that everybody will be called Jane. Everybody's Jane. And now if I refresh this, now everybody is Jane. The where allows you to target what you're updating and deleting. It is important to target. My example here is stupid. I've got two rows. I've got a database at my day job that's sitting at uh, 12 million rows. You don't. You try to find an excuse on why it happened. And you pray there was a power outage. And you hope you had a backup recently. Uh, which is why normally you don't do this on the production database the first time just to be on the safe side. So that is that one. So if I want to update, um, oh, come on. No, it's not that, now I just wrecked my command. Update sample set name equal to, he no longer interprets as a person at all, where ID is equal to two, but I can also say, um, date of birth is, uh, apparently they were born in, uh, that year because they're no longer human. And I'm, this will allow you to update both, both columns at once. And I go run and now you will see that number two is now blah. And they were born in 1023. That's how you do updates. That's really just all there is to it. Yes. Yes, and I'll be teaching you guys about the where clause next time. Right now, I'm just showing you guys single row targets because you know what? 90% of the time you're writing code to update a database, you're updating one row. Imagine where you go, oh, I'm going to update my profile on this website. And it decides, oh, we're going to update everybody who has the same date of birth. There's a range. Now everybody is Lydia. Because they decided to be Lydia that day. Right? It could be any number of things. But that is literally all there is to, to the update statement. As long as you remember a very basic set of rules. And sweep. You'll notice that if that the little the little broom on the toolbar allows you to clean up your code, makes it easier to read. So the rule is for updates is you go update what you're trying to update. The next keyword is going to be set. And after that, you have a comma delimited list of columns and values. And then where if you're trying to not reassociate everybody to something else. It's a pretty straightforward command when you see it. 
I guarantee you'll all make mistakes when you first start doing this. That's just how it is. But it's a fairly straightforward command. So I'm going to copy this. Shoot, you know what I didn't do? Was I forgot to keep my commands in here. Let's see how far back I can go real quick. Pew, 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 pew. I want to give you guys at least some examples. Come on, back, 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 back. There. That's that's the important commands from today. Thank goodness for undo. What is this unredo command? Oh, it's control Y? Who does control Y? Okay, I'm back to where I was. All right. So now, that was insert and update. Bulk update, which is really we just demonstrated. Bulk update is an update without a where clause. Congrats. Um. You can also, as you asked for a range, um, this is really, really odd because some of the samples here have content that you guys haven't learned about yet and you're going to be learning about next week. Uh, this one here is where the city is equal to Denver. In other words, it's basically going to update anybody who has a city called Denver. Uh, even without having learned about the where clause, you can identify that fairly easily what it's trying to do as long as you can read it. And like I said earlier, it's a very English-like language. Update customer, you're going to set the area code to 303 where the city is equal to Denver. You can literally read it like a sentence. And there is a reason for that. And I'll give you guys that in a moment. Um, that one here, I'm not going to touch until next until later. And then this is the delete command. Delete from customer. Where? You give it an ID. If you do not include the, if you omit the where, it nukes the entire contents of the table. Uh, no, it's slightly different, and I'll explain the difference in a moment. So I'm going to go and put in uh, a few inserts in here. I'm going to run them all. You'll notice that I ran them all, and it's all the exact same data. SQL doesn't care because the primary key takes care of keeping them unique. The rest of the data is all the same. All right, so if I go delete from sample where ID is equal to one, and I go run, you'll notice that it ran in 0, 0.000 seconds. If I refresh this, Jane is gone. The database engine is insanely fast. Um, on a million row table, it will run just as fast as long as the indexes are, you know, in good condition, which the primary key is an index. It's going to go fast. If I were to turn around and say, and I've never done this by mistake. No. Now the table is empty. So that's a bulk up. It's a bulk delete because I deleted everything. Now, he asked if it was the same thing as a truncate. No. The difference is as follows. Let me just um, do this again. You'll notice the IDs continue incrementing. 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay. Now I am going to truncate sample. run that you will notice that the table is empty it happened just as fast oops i hit go the id is restarted at one that's the difference between delete everything and truncate at least in my sql other database engines not necessarily guarantee oracle and postgres do not reset to one microsoft sql server has been so long i couldn't tell you don't assume that it's going to reset it. Because, you know, when you assume you make an ass out of you and me, 
Roya, A-S-S-U-M-E. That's an old joke, but it's true. Yeah, I know I'm old. So the big difference is, like, if you do a bulk delete like this, it doesn't set the surrogate keys. Uh, I'm not even going to talk about that one. Okay, so the last one is the merge, and I'm not even going to talk about merge because I've never used it. It is never going to be on the test. I guarantee it's not going to be on the final exam. So I'm going to pretend this slide does not exist. I am... Eh? Nope. I didn't know it existed until uh, the prof who made these slides actually put it on there. It's one of those things where, with a lot of programming languages, you don't learn about all the features until you need certain features. Um, and I will show you guys one last little bit that is important, which is the select statement. You've noticed this has been running. Okay. This is your very first select statement. This is the equivalent of hello world in database. You guys probably did hello world in Java, right? That's pretty much the first program they always get everybody to do is hello world or give me your name or, you know, something. This is the equivalent of hello world for SQL. It's select star from some table. This is give me all the columns from this table. And because there's no where clause, it also says give me all the rows. So you'll notice I've been using the select statement since, you know, switching between tabs. Select allows you to look at the contents of the table. That's all. Uh, later, actually, I think next week is when I'm going to dive into more of the select statement stuff, including um, the where clause, selecting different columns, how that works, um, you know, using predicates, that kind of stuff. But that is day one of SQL. Compared to, it is not very theoretical. You noticed? There's nothing really nebulous. It Here's the command. This is what it does. This is what happens when you fuck up. Pardon the phrase. Some of you might not like bad language, but that is a very common phrase. It's on the request. It's going to go right to YouTube. It's going right to YouTube. As a person who has truncated the wrong table on a production system, because I hadn't had my second cup of coffee yet, and somebody was rushing me, they said, oh, we really need to figure out what the problem is here. Okay, hang on. Let me go truncate this table because that's just uh, a security table that uh, doesn't allow, um, essentially when somebody would access a certain web page, it would pass along called a, a, GUI, a, a GUID, a global unique ID. And you could never reuse that global unique ID again for up to three days. It's just to throttle bad people so that bad people can't keep hammering the server with, you know, goods. And the table was called something underscore goods. And I truncated something without underscore goods. And we lost the configuration for all of our activations. I had a backup of that table. I had a backup of that database. I restored the database into another instance, dumped the contents of that table and repopulated it. It took me 20 minutes to fix a mistake that I did in about one and a half seconds. So that proportionally, it was not a good proportion of time to make the mistake to time to fix the mistake. And it's, I was just lucky that nobody had modified those tables since the backup. It was just dumb luck. Especially when I ran it, I'm like, when I hear the phone rings, it goes, yeah, activations just stopped working. Oh, no. <laughs> backup. Oh, is there a back? Did the backups run? Praise Amazon. All right. Um, oh, commenting. Yes, comments. So when you submit your files to the labs, you are supposed to put a comment in there with your name and your student number. It's two dashes. That's a single line comment. Um, hang on, I'm not sure if this works in my in MySQL. Uh, they finally gave us this in MySQL. Other database engines don't support 
the multi-line finally. Like other database engines like Postgres doesn't do multi-line comments. It's that's non-standard. So the C the C style comment, like this multi-line comment that you guys are so happy doing, works in MySQL, does not work in half the most of the other database engines. Some of you will go, oh, I'm gonna make a comment like this. No. It's not gonna work. I I guarantee let's see what kind of error message this gives us. You have an error in your SQL syntax. Check the manual. It, it literally doesn't know what the problem is. That's what it is. It says, there's something wrong here. Oh, remember earlier when I said that MySQL is like the world's, like SQL is the stupidest calculator? 2023 minus, oh, no, let's go 2022 minus 12 minus 15. Oops, not that. It's a calculator. And I, hey, hey, we can do a complete math. We can do this if we want. That's a calculator. Or if you don't know what, when, what the time is right now. So these are just stupid SQL tricks. A different uh, time format, yeah, yeah, but it's called it's kind of a special function, which we'll worry about later. Okay, so yes, that was important. Thank you for bringing me the com but talk about comments. Yeah, comments double dash. Just get into the habit of not using the star slash slash uh, star slash you know slash star star slash thing, because you'll start doing it, and then suddenly you get a job where you're not working with MySQL, and then you'll wonder why your your comments are no good. So just get into the habit of doing. These kinds of comments. I mean, if you want to get fancy with your comments, you know, how do I do it? You'll notice right here that it stayed black. Now it's a comment because it wasn't a comment. This is comment. Notice the space. Remember earlier I cared that MySQL is white space delimited? That's your best example of a white space delimit, is that. Which is why a lot of students like using the slash star star slash because I'm used to doing that in Java class. It's all good. I don't need to think about it. Honestly, the lab profs aren't going to give a shit. I, usually they don't. Um, I actually I was one of the ones I was anal about that because it's non-standard. And I try to get you guys to use standard SQL as much as possible. Or, you know, what they call ANSI SQL, which is SQL that works across more than one database engine. Why get into habits of writing stuff that doesn't work everywhere? Okay, so that is that. Uh, next week, we're going to be diving into uh, the select statement. Actually, I'll, I'll give you guys a really big shocker. You've already got everything you need to do for the first third of the second assignment. This is a shocker. So when assignment two comes out, you literally have everything you need to do the first third of the assignment already, as of today. Uh, next two weeks. You'll literally have almost everything for your assignment except for one thing. Yeah, part assignment two. Yeah. So lab six is a lab where you're creating tables based on a diagram. You're going to insert some rows. You're going to delete some rows. And that's what that lab is. It's actually, the labs at this point, you will notice, they're going to do this. Morning and I, lots of you are chatting, and you're going to regret not hearing what I'm saying right now. Lab 9 makes grown men cry. Warning you now, I've been told by many students that Lab 9 is hard. Lab six is hard because the syntax is new. Lab seven is actually pretty easy. Lab eight's a little harder. Lab nine is Dark Souls. So, just warning you now. Hey, eh? the assi assignment? It's not that bad. It's just time consuming. 
Lab nine is hard. <laughs>